Good evening, everyone. The American Horticultural Society is pleased to welcome you to today's program, Conversations with Great American Gardeners, featuring a dialogue between Ira Wallace and Holly Shimitsu. For the past 70 years, the American Horticultural Society's Great American Gardener Awards have recognized excellence in plant professions. Speakers in this year's webinar series are selected from among the awardees. These webinars and all AHS programs share about the critical role of plants, gardens, and green spaces in creating healthy, livable communities and a sustainable planet. Now, I may be a new face for some of you. My name is Courtney Allen, and I joined the American Horticultural Society this past winter as Director of National Programs. I come with a background and a passion in gardens programming, landscape history, and museum education. Prior to joining AHS, I directed and managed educational programs for the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University, for Native Plant Trust, and for the Huntington Gardens. I'm delighted to be part of the AHS team and to grow our national programs in exciting new ways. Now, as we begin tonight's program, a reminder that we are in webinar format. This is a format used for large audiences. We have several hundred registrants for this program. In webinar format, only the presenters have their cameras and mics enabled. So the chat and raise hand functions are not available to the audience in this format. However, you are welcome to submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We will answer as many questions as our time allows at the end of the program. I am pleased to introduce our conversation facilitator for the evening, Holly Shimitsu. Holly has been a lover of plants, gardens, and nature since her childhood. After studying horticulture at Penn State, she worked in European gardens for over three years. Upon her return, she became the first curator of the National Herb Garden at the U.S. National Arboretum and received her Master's of Science in Horticulture from the University of Maryland. She worked as a managing director for the Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden in Richmond, Virginia and then was executive director of the U.S. Botanic Garden for 15 years. Currently, Holly is on the board of the American Horticultural Society and the American Botanical Council. She heads the Environmental Committee in her town and writes for their newspaper. She wrote and illustrated her first children's book, Vicki and Fiona Search for a Home, and is now working on her second book. Holly has received many awards and honors for her work, and for over 10 years, Holly was one of the hosts of the Victory Garden television show on PBS. Welcome to Holly, who will introduce tonight's featured guest, Ira Wallace. Thank you, Courtney. And this is really a fantastic opportunity to hear all about the incredible work and life of Ira. She is a worker owner of the cooperatively managed Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, which offers over 700 varieties of open pollinated heirloom and organic seeds selected for flavor and regional adaptability. Ira serves on the boards of the Organic Seed Alliance and the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. She is a member of the Acorn Community, which farms over 60 acres of certified organic land in central Virginia. She also writes about heirloom vegetables and seed saving for magazines. She blogs, including for Mother Earth News, Fine Gardening, and Southern Exposure. She does hands-on workshops and demonstrations. So in 2019, Ira was named a Great American Gardener by the American Horticultural Society. And very recently, in 2023, she was the leadership award winner, James Beard Foundation. She also is the author of Timber Press Guide to Vegetable Gardening in the Southeast. Her new state-specific book series, including Grow Great Vegetables in Virginia. So these books are available online or at booksellers pretty much everywhere. And now Ira is working on creating an African diasporic seed collection. And this is very interesting and she will tell us about it. So I was very curious, um, Ira, to maybe start with, you know, the fact that you have been um, building up sources for seed for most of your life. And what inspired you to do this? Um, 
Well, I guess it started with my grandmother. I grew up with in her garden in Florida and we just had a lot of things that were old fashioned. And um, when she passed away the year I went to college uh, and I wanted to have a student garden, we had to look really hard to find the kinds of things that I wanted to grow. And then later, uh, a few years later, when we moved to North Carolina and I volunteered at the North Carolina Botanical Gardens, uh, it was a time when they were building Kerr Lake, a new reservoir for Chapel Hill. And um, they were doing a lot of plant rescue and creating habitats for reproducing and cultivation seeds for these native plants. And each opportunity got me a little more interested in saving seeds because there were things that say seeds weren't there. And the, the exchange part of what we do, which is now more events and things like when we were doing the Heritage Harvest Festival and having a big seed swap or, uh, you know, uh, ventures that we do with um, groups uh, just to uh, make people aware not only how to grow something, but how to save seeds so that when you have uh, circumstances like what was going on in the 70s and 80s when I first got into it, that there are more people and more sources of uh, these important varieties for local communities. So I guess you would say it was a little bit of this and a little bit of that. <laughs> so I know one of the things you're really into, um, Ira, are the stories of seeds. And so could you tell us a little, maybe you have a good story or two you could tell us to really help us appreciate these heirloom seeds? I will. I'll tell you first uh, a collard story. It, this is a relatively recent one. Uh, there were two cultural geographers who wrote a book, Collards, a Southern Tale from Seed to Table. And this was uh, when I was working on organizing the program for the Heritage Harvest Festival at Monticello. And Ed Davis sent me a copy of the book in 2015. Uh, and I was just happened to be going to a garden writers event in Charleston where <clears throat> a trial of these uh, heirloom collards, which uh, Davis and Morgan had collected over probably five years in the, mostly in the nineties in, the Carolinas, Georgia, well, pretty much all through the collard belt. And they had collected 90 different accessions. Wow. I, I, they're purple ones, curly ones, crinkly ones, you know, ones that become variegated in the winter. It was amazing with many different play, favorite profiles and a little bit of stories of the communities where they had been uh, shepherded in kept going. For example, in Alabama, Mississippi, there were a lot of purple veined and purple colored collards and not so much in other parts, whereas, you know, cabbage collards and more yellow green collards were uh, more frequently found in uh, the Carolinas and Georgia grows big collards. Oh. <laughs> uh, and the, the, the story of how these guys collected them, they got a small grant uh, geo from the American Geographical Society. And uh, they would go on these car trips in the winter when generally the only thing you can see from the road in a garden were collards. And if they saw a big patch, they would go up, knock on the door, knock, knock. And uh -huh. Are those your lovely collards out there? And of course, the gardener was delighted and told them all about it. 
and often they left with a nice jar of seeds and those seeds were deposited uh, in uh, the uh, U U.S. Uh, gene bank. And so when the book came out, I after seeing this trial in Charleston that had not 90, but 60 of the varieties, uh, I worked with the Sea Tables Southern Exposure and the Sea Tables Exchange uh, in Iowa worked together to get uh, from the USDA all of the varieties that they had enough of to share. And uh, we did a big trial that first year and then we just started talking about it at events, online, we wrote in magazines, and uh, the first group that responded to that was a Southern Garden Heritage Meeting happened in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and um, a, a lady there Lorraine Mertis, who's a lawyer and a black Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority sister, talked her sisters into uh, regenerating one of the varieties that had been uh, traditionally shepherded in an area near them by an African American uh, man. And they were successful. These were not ladies, they grew flowers, not vegetables. Uh, but they took care of keeping the deer out of the patch uh, and keeping them through the winter. And they got a nice crop of seed and sent some to go in the gene bank at Seed Savers Exchange, who was preparing a deposit for Svalbard, the global seed bank. And this became the first uh, known African-American contribution to the global seed bank. So. Oh, that's fantastic. It sounds like you have a lot of partners that you work with in all different aspects of what you're doing. Well, we're co-op and it is really, gardeners are cooperative sharing type people. And uh, many of the garden gardeners and organizations uh, that are interested in preserving heirlooms and uh, having genetic diversity and having more food sovereignty in local communities know that we need to do this work together. We aren't, you know, trying to have uh, a bigger piece of a small pie. We want to have a bigger pie that we all are contributing to. Well, you'll have a lot much greater impact that way, no doubt. So, it's great that you're doing that. Now, what about the actual um, seed saving techniques? Is that something that's complicated and just giving people an idea of, of if they have a special family heirloom and they want to save the seeds, what should they do? Well, start simple. Generally speaking, if you have a variety that someone has been saving in your family, you can get uh, hands-on instruction of how to carry that on. But sometimes that person has passed on. Uh, however, there are a lot of resources out there. The Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, southernexposure.com has tons of uh, articles about seed saving for particular things. The Seed Savers Exchange uh, has a lot of information. So the seed library movement has information there and uh, a lot of international organizations also have them. And there's some great books, Seed to Sea by Suzanne Ashworth. Okay. The Seed Garden that was put out more recently by uh, the Seed Tavers Exchange uh, has information from their years of members seed saving and small gardens in addition to information from the organic seed alliance about uh, li larger scale growing if you're a small uh, farm who wants to grow 
So there's a lot of things, but start out with the simple ones. And those are ones that are self-pollinated so that you don't need to have a large population of plants in order mm. to grow good seeds. And they also generally don't need uh, such a wide isolation distance from other things uh, in the same family, that is the same genus and species. Uh, so commonly I tell people that you can start out safely with beans, peas, tomatoes, peppers. And those are things that are really commonly grown in vegetable gardens. The thing is you, you want to make sure you know the isolation distance uh, for them. And if you're growing for home uh, seed saving, you only need with those types, you know, 25 to 50 feet. If you're growing to sell where you really want to have a high degree of certainty, then you might have more like 150 feet for those. Okay. But because they're self-pollinating, you can also use those little organza bags and yeah. cover the flower and let it uh, self-pollinate where you know nothing was getting in there. And then when the little fruit starts to form, you can take it off and put a, a colored piece of yarn or ribbon to tell you which plants you isolate because you don't need that many seeds if you're just growing for your own use. Yeah. Now, I think you have uh, farmers um, all over that are actually growers of many of the seeds. Is that true? Yes. When we first took over the stewardship of Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, we grew a lot of the seed on our farm. But as the number of people who wanted to have seeds increase, we suddenly needed more. And so we have a network of farmers and some of them are big gardeners for things like herbs where it doesn't need a lot of space to have a lot of plants. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, they contract to grow seeds uh, for us. And we do germination testing and also uh, trials in the garden to make sure that what we sent to people comes back true to type. Uh, and it's kind of wonderful because these are people who are interested in this kind of thing. It gives you another small stream of income for your farm and it allows you to save seeds that you can use uh, for your own market gardening as well. So um, I'm thinking about um, the advantages of heirloom seeds and why they would be in some ways so much better than some of the other seeds we might get. Well, there are ways in which heirloom seeds are definitely superior. If you're working on maintaining genetic diversity in our food sources, not just uh, with the things that we're used to, but adding more uh, genuses and more s different species to our diet so that it's just like you want to have a rainbow on your plate. Yes. Uh, and so that's one thing. They were also selected at a time when nutrient denseness mattered. The people were actually using their garden as a primary source of food. And so uh, these varieties are like that. And many of them have really great flavor too. They don't necessarily have as much uh, productivity uh, as uh, some of the more modern hybrids where you can get a lot of production. But, the, but many of them have good production and good disease resistance if you're trying to grow organically that's important so um i think the flavor the interesting uh appearance so that your food is appealing to eat and uh maintaining genetic diversity they together make it a really important thing because uh these plants 
they bring with them that tale and that flavor from a time that has passed, but that we have great memories of from our grandmothers and uh, from our neighborhood uh, restaurants and bakeries that are trying to uh, have local food. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, so one of the things that is interesting, too, about you is what you work, something you're working on now, the African diasporic, dias, I can't pronounce it, diasporic seed collection of the African diaspora. Tell us about it. Well, you know, the, the story of how African people were stolen and brought to the United States um, is one that needs to be retold in, in the light of what really happened. Uh, these people were farming people, good agriculturalists. And uh, for example, in, in Charleston, uh, they had a rice culture. These Europeans didn't know anything about rice and they stole African people and enslaved them and they built uh, the rice uh, culture of the low country in the Carolinas. And with this African diaspora collection, I'm looking to bring things like that, that you don't think of yourself as growing in a home garden, but you can grow upland rice in a home garden and you can have it be a special dish. Yeah. Um, so we have that. And, you know, in the summer, we, we like our greens these days. And in the summer, it's hard to grow a lot of the ones that we're most commonly used to that are from Northern Europe uh, or even the Mediterranean. Uh, but there are things um, like Molokia, our Egyptian spinach, um, and the Malabar spinach, yeah, the edible celosias that we're not so accustomed to having that grow very well, amaranth, they grow very well in the summer and they were uh, a part of the diet in Africa. And so I get to have a new vegetable that we can grow well in the dog days of summer and to ta have an opportunity to tell a little bit of the story of uh, the varieties that the enslaved African people uh, that came along with them in the, during that unfortunate time. Yeah, and then also some of these uh, heirloom seeds, the, if not saved, would actually become extinct. It's so true because uh, the finances of running many things in the United States is, uh, has been pushed toward get big or get out in agriculture. And uh, that meant that instead of selecting for something that is the best for your little region or your state, uh, companies were looking for things that are widely adapted over a, a big area. And that has advantages for their finances, but it doesn't have the advantage of having something that does ex extremely well in your particular microclimate, mm. the t particular kind of soils that you have. And so, um, yeah, so. We, what about uh, the, the correct storage for um, storing your seeds? You wanna have them cool and dry and in a dark area the word of mouth is, or little uh, thing that we use is to take a hundred you want the relative humidity and temperature to not be over a hundred if you can okay uh, and so uh places you find places in your home that are dry, like if you have a basement and it's a dry basement, you can keep your seeds there. 
uh, sometimes a closet is, in the interior of the home is a, a good location uh, to keep them. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you want to keep them longer, you can also dry them a little bit more and uh, put them in mason jars or Ziploc uh, freezer bags in the freezer uh, to keep them longer. Okay. So I know another thing you're involved with too is teaching people how to have a year round vegetable garden or a year round garden. Yes, because I live in Virginia and in Virginia, winter in some ways can be one of the best gardening times, but you have to start it with summer planting for your fall and winter garden. Uh, and so that's one of the ways that I got so much into these collards because we'll start them actually in July. And, uh, you know, you can get away with August. Uh, and then, you know, we start them and then transplant them when they're like four to six weeks old and uh, other greens like kale, you can direct sow in late August to September. Many uh, of the Chinese vegetables and uh, do and Korean vegetables do very well. The greens planted in August and September through the winter. I love alliums and they grow all winter. You can have green onions. I, I went to um, a Korean lady who I had met at the health food store. She <laughs> lived nearby and she invited me to see her garden. And she must have had 16 kinds of uh, green onions that she was growing. And I was like, yeah. Love them. Um, love that garlic too. Totally. Yeah. Now, I know Southern Exposure has reintroduced or introduced some incredibly um, now popular plants, right? Yeah. Uh, so, we introduced Cherokee Purple Tomato. Oh, I love that one. In the first year that it went out, uh, our founder, Jeff McCormick, said, this is a, an incredibly delicious uh tomato, but it's for the adventurous gardener because it looks a bit like a bruised arm. Uh, and so if you if you want to try something new and delicious, this is for you. And they were oh. off and running. Yeah, because I, I think nowadays we know a lot of what we see in the grocery store. I mean, they're all uniform. They look alike. They've been on the shelf or in the truck forever, but they have no flavor. Yes, this is true. And they're all the same color, you know, like garden peach uh, tomatoes. They're little yellow ones with just a little blush of mm -hmm. red and they are really delicious. Yeah, so um, I also um, know that your, uh, Southern Exposure, you have reached out to farmers, say in, um, in Haiti and Liberia. And that's, that's very interesting. Well, we feel that uh, we in the United States and in the gardening world are blessed with a lot of resources and a lot of land. And, uh, and for the most part, uh, not such extreme weather. And what we, there are two ways that we've reached out to gardeners, in adding varieties that come with immigrants to this country to our catalog. But the other is uh, offering varieties of seeds that uh, programs like say Seed Pro Programs International who work with local on the ground agriculturalists and distribute seeds when there have been uh, climactic disruptions and uh, that's one of the things we do because it's more value to give them the seeds that they're looking for than uh, some amount of money that um, they don't have the person 
people on the ground to actually uh, gather up those seeds and ones that are appropriate for their climate to, yeah. to do that. And we sometimes work with groups, women's groups to help them learn seed saving skills so that they can take the seeds and their own native seeds and uh, replenish the supply for their community. Yeah, and I heard of another really uh, new variety that you all um, introduced, Puerto Rican everbush okra. Yes, uh, <laughs> Chris Smith, who wrote the whole okra uh, book, introduced us to that variety. And it is like one of the tastiest new okras we have. And I like pickled okra and it really pickles up really nicely. Ooh. Well, I, I have to say that um, when I, I when I go into your catalog, it is incredibly helpful. It is filled with these delicious, fabulous seeds that you offer and growing guides and information that's actually reliable. And um, it's, it's an incredible resource, um, whether you go online or, or get the catalog. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing the kind of um, diverse seeds that, that you really do introduce. And one of the things that's mentioned is ecosystem diversity. And I think that's kind of interesting. Can you tell us about that? Well, it, it's if you want to have an organic garden and you want to have uh, natural predators uh, help you out, you have to have not just that one crop that they're getting, you know, say that the bees are getting nectar from, but you want to have places where they can reproduce places where they can winter over. We call it being a little messy. So that you have some areas that are like that. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, so, you know, we have borders around the edges of our gardens and we encourage people to do that. We do a lot of work with trying to see how little tillage we can do so that uh, the living web that's in the ground is not disturbed any more than is necessary uh, and is built up from the soil from on the top level and taken down by the living creatures who are using uh, those things and uh, yeah so, so if you if you want to build the soil on that topic and you say you need more organic matter do you apply a layer of compost on top do you scratch it in or just leave it on top or if you have uh enough compost to put you know a couple of inches at least uh a lot of people are finding good success with just putting it on top and planting into it it works better that way if you're transplanting Mm. Your plants can spread, you know, over uh, the area sooner. Uh, and if you're going to turn it in to do it in that just that top two to four inches and not uh, going down deeper, uh, unless you're dealing with, you know, some hard pan or something. Yes. Well, another area that's fascinating related to the topic is um, lessons from indigenous people about um, the seeds that they have handed from generation to generation. And I read on one of your blogs that um, the seeds, they often refer to them as their relatives. Right, well, it, it has been, the native people tried to offer the settlers a lot of support, but that didn't happen. And not only were their lands taken, but the what they'd learned from things, you know, just 
simple things that you can see uh, nixtamalization of corn, uh, that you grow corn, but you nixtamalize it so that you can have more of the nutrients available. And that kind of knowledge or th that burning can be uh, applied judiciously and reduce the weed population and make a, a better garden. And that was, you know, not uh, incorporated into the practices. And certainly just building up uh, organic matter as a way, but now we do that uh, with our gardens. We even have tarping where you can cover and take all the light uh, off of the weed seeds, you know, get an area and just cut the weeds down and uh, water them and then cover them with a silage tarp or something like that and uh, then come back and plant directly into them without disturbing the soil. Yes. These build on native uh, traditions that um, native people are trying to dis rediscover for themselves as well. Yes. It's so interesting. Well, I know we need to um, get to questions soon, but I wanted to make sure to clarify for all the people in joining the webinar that um, they can find the 2023 catalog um, by going to www.southernexposure.com. And I highly encourage you to, to go to it. And I think you'll find it really inspiring and informative and fun. It, it's a very fun catalog. And so, um, and I think every year it's different, right, Ira? Yes, well, we keep certain a certain base that's the same, but we rotate out because we maintain in our seed banks about 900 varieties and we can't have all of those in the catalog. Every time yeah. we try to rotate them and new ones that we uh, come into contact with because you get these stories like these beans, we call them Grandma Nellie's mushroom beans because they, when they're cooked, they taste a little bit like mushrooms, but there's no one in our family who wants to carry it on. Maybe you will. And uh -huh. we, it, breaks your heart and you want to make room for that as well oh totally yeah i mean and people will want to many of us would want that mushroom flavor yeah 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 and um so i i gather you had an article in the new york times and uh everybody wrote for the catalog oh well it is a little bit embarrassing we ordered what we thought was an adequate number of catalogs, but when the New York Times article came out during one of the busiest months of the year, we went through what we would have gone through in the next three months in like three weeks. Oh, I'm not surprised. Uh, we, we put aside a few catalogs, but we're not doing bulk mailings until the new catalog is out a little bit later in the year. But if you if you really have to have it, you can pay first class postage and we'll send you directly one of the ones that are left. Okay, but it, it's also pretty easy to get it online and order that way, right? Yes, and there are even more varieties available online than there are in the catalog because uh, we can put uh, varieties that come to us a little bit too late for the catalog printing deadline. Yeah. All right. Well, I've already got a long list, so I'm I'm ordering online because I this is going to be my garlic year. <laughs> I love right. garlic. So good. I love garlic. So it's really been a pleasure to um, have this conversation with you. And I do want to have enough time for questions. And so, um, Courtney, I hope we can turn it over you to you to handle our questions for Ira. 
Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to just pop back on the screen. Here we are. Uh, and I'm just, this is such a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Ira. And I love this, this thread of, you know, the stories of seeds or the stories of people and the stories of people or the stories of seeds. It's just, it's fantastic. And um, we do have a few questions coming in, but for those of you who are listening, please continue to put questions into the Q&A. Um, one of them you actually just answered, which was, uh, I went online and looked at the catalog, but it's it's out of stock. Like, when will it be resupplied? So you, you mentioned about that. Um, the next one is, it's a very joyful question, which is, how does it feel to be a James Beard Award winner? <laughs> <laughs> I I felt funny. I thought. <laughs> What did I do to get be recognized with such a fancy organization? The Horticultural Society, I can say, you're, you're fancy, but you're down in the garden with me. Uh, <laughs> but I saw that the James Beard Foundation is trying to reach out to the whole chain of people who are part of our food uh, system. And, uh, the work with trying to make good food available in all kinds of communities and not just the rich and famous. Mm. So important, that's so important. Um, another question is about the USDA trials that you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and the, the the actual question on here from uh, from Diane, hi Diane, is you know what constitutes a trial? But I think also you know, for people who are not familiar with how USDA trials work, can you share a little bit about you know, how that relationship works between um, the farmers and the USDA and um, the different kinds of choices of what goes to trial or the protocols, things along those lines. There, there are a lot of different kinds of trials. Uh, many of them, they start out with observational trials. So you pick a, a selection, which might be uh, you know, traditional varieties for a certain area and uh, get seeds from the best sources that you can. And then uh, in those kind of trials, you might have only one selection, you know, one section for each vegetable uh, variety. But with others, when it's uh, more of a replicated trial this is when you're getting hardcore about taking uh seeing about disease resistance or yield under certain conditions then you will have usually uh three replications and that is three plots say that are 10 feet that are randomly distributed in in the plot so that you're not having thinking something is better because it's on the edge of the field, for example, right. or it was in an area that had not as good drainage or something like that. And usually uh, they often happen at the research station, but nowadays it's much more common uh, to have mother-daughter trials where the research station or the university has a, a big trial and then they have several farmers that are doing smaller trials nearby so that you get the whole region and you get the real conditions of on-farm growing. Fascinating. That's that's really fantastic. So as a, a follow-up question, we, we just got uh, one from Teresa. Hello, Teresa. Um, and it's a little bit about that, about participation. So is there a way or what are the ways for community gardens to participate in trying new varieties in order to increase and share and, and help spread the word about heirloom crops? Well, uh, there is a, a really great program that the Seed Savers Exchange has uh, of having various citizens sciences trials that they put up out uh, each year and they'll send you some seeds for you to grow and make whatever the set of our observations for that year and send them back. We were involved with the Collard Project in a really big one with this, with Seed Savers and Southern Exposure and uh, 
the Utopian Seed Project on a platform called Seedlink. And over 200 people were involved in that trial who volunteered and grew heirloom three, some three varieties. And the 10 biggest trials each uh, had 20 varieties. Uh, so you can, you can sign up, become a member of Seeds Every Exchange and uh, get sent information about these trials. You can also uh, reach out to your local agricultural college and become a cooperating farm if you're generally you need to be farm scale to you know do the size trials that they want to do. And uh, many uh, organizations uh, that are local have local trials that are like for community garden conditions or so forth that you can reach out to as well. And maybe I'll put up a page on our website with some addresses. That would be fantastic. I think there are probably a lot of people, you know, wondering about those resources and nobody knows it better than you do. So <laughs> we're glad to be able to find out about this. Um, the next question, uh, it's about about rain patterns. I'm interested in hearing both of your, your thoughts on this. And um, Madeline asks, has climate change, um, well, so first she says that she lives in South Carolina and um, sees that you have a book on growing the vegetables in that, um, that geography. Now, has climate change and the current trend of long dry spells and then a lot of rain um, in a, you know, in a significant amount in a short period of time, how has that impacted the um you know agriculture especially on a small scale on a farm and um what would you recommend in order to work with that well <laughs> i say for the organic gardener compost and organic material is good for what ails you <laughs> uh, and not it's not just joking uh the same thing you know that will hold water when there is no rain is what will keep the water from drowning your plants when there's too much of it all at once because it gives having more organic matter allows the the rain to spread out quickly and uh, be absorbed so that's one thing and uh, people who are using uh, permaculture techniques, plant, planting your beds so that they take advantage of natural drainage patterns is a, another thing that can people can do that really help with water. I wonder what Holly has been thinking. Well, no, I completely agree with those two. And um, <laughs> in my own case, I just am very careful and cautious when plants are young. And so, uh, you know, I pay attention to that. Um, and I, if I can, may have to provide a little water just until they get a good root system. I don't want them to depend on irrigation. I just want them to make it through. We recently, we've had just these intense droughts. And so some of my new plants or transplanted plants are just, you know, really suffering. So I just really pay attention to them when they're young or maybe put a little shade over them um, so that they won't, you know, get a, a really strong baking in the midday sun. But um, those are the things that came to mind. But I, I also, um, when I studied with a man, he's passed on um, Dr. Frank Gouin, and he, he was considered in Maryland the king of compost. And he agreed with you about the benefits of compost and all the different things that it could do. And, um, you know, I just teach, try to encourage people, you know, to, to use compost or even to make compost. And if they don't do that, then to use their home leaves and to you know re reuse what they have so that they can build their own uh, mulch compost that is so beneficial in so many ways. 
Fantastic. And the same person also has a, a follow-up question just to clarify. So she's saying, so you don't put irrigation into your vegetable beds. Oh, we use irrigation for sure, mm -hmm. but try to have it so that it is not something that you have to irrigate, you know, twice a week to get enough water for your plants. You want to improve your soil so that you don't need that except perhaps in that first few weeks after you transplant. Great, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions here and we'll see if any more come through. Um, one of them is, you know, I think one of the most beautiful things that I heard you say today, Ira, was about, you know, it's not that we want everyone competing for a bigger slice of a small pie. It's that we want to have a bigger pie and make that bigger pie together, right? And um, you talked about the pairing of food sovereignty and collaboration. And can you talk a little bit more about that, about what each of those means to you and how they work together? Well, I I think of food sovereignty as more a matter of local communities having the resources to solve many of their problems with the resources on hand, and that is things like seeds, uh, local composting, recycling leaves uh, so that they can be used by citizens, that kind of thing. And having schools that give uh, basic education about gardening, just like basic education about reading and arithmetic. Mm. Uh, we we want to be able to take care of everyday things ourselves. Um, so that's you 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 said. And what was the other thing you wanted about, about a food sovereignty and collaboration? That's really collaborative. In order to have communities where everyone you know has access to good food, it takes a lot of people cooperating, you know, uh, parks becoming places that have fruit and nut trees, for example, uh, where there are more community gardens, uh, where churches that have extra land are using it, uh, both for recreation and for food production uh, and things like uh, you know citizens working to help reforest public lands and this is things like medians with small tr growing trees and stuff like that so that the that it's not just rich people who have nice green roadsides Fascinating. Thank you. And Holly, uh, any thoughts on yeah, community and gardening and education around um, around gardening? Yes, well, I, I have also seen that the um, having a community involved in gardening brings life to a community and uh, socially and um, in so many ways. And I know I've, I've been reading about the blue zones, you know, for years where, you know, people live to be over a hundred, but they're healthy. And um, it seems that almost all of them garden and they, you know, they have a garden and they harvest and they are physically active with the garden. In addition to the fact that it connects them with people. And I really, I love that aspect of it as well, because we, we all need community and, um, and gardens really can give us that as well as these amazing foods. And the thrill of, of something new to me is so exciting. I love trying new things and, 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 and then having people try, you know, taste them and it, it's all, it's quite thrilling. So I am, so happy to see more people involved in developing gardens, especially in areas where, you know, it has not happened before. It's, it's very, um, you know, it's very hopeful. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you. 
uh, and speaking of new of new things and interesting things, we have a question from Josie. Um, what should we do if we come into contact with people who have unusual seeds? Well, one of the things is you can send samples, just like I tell you, we get these random letters, uh, you know, to people like Southern Exposure, or the Seed Savers Exchange, uh, and to evaluate. We can't always uh, work with every variety if it's not so well suited to our region, but uh, that's an important thing. And the other is share them with people in your local community. Mm -hmm. uh, because if it's been being saved there, it might be a good place to keep growing it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I think that this is a, a wonderful question to finish on. So I will give each of you an opportunity to say any final words before I make a couple of announcements and we finish up our time together. Okay. Should should I go first? You are well, you are either one of you. I, <laughs> Welcome to go. Okay, well, I guess I can just say um, for me being involved in this program has really enhanced my deeper understanding of why heirloom heirlooms are so important and and valuable and um it's a fun thing to be involved with too, for many reasons. But um, you know, being really, really into flavor, uh, you know, I want to get the best flavor from things um, wherever I'm either purchasing them or growing them, and and so I I I leave this session tonight extremely inspired, um, you know, to. To, to activate more in this area of uh, heirloom seeds and heirloom plants. So thank you, Ira. So what are your final thoughts? My thoughts are, it's a really important thing to have all people have an opportunity who want to garden, to interact with the natural world and to have good, healthy food and uh, I love seeing more people, more organizations, more parts of society paying attention to these important uh, factors. And we want to not only have the heirlooms of the past, we want to be a part of creating the heirlooms of the future. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ira. All right. Wonderful conversation. Many thanks to both of you, Holly and Ira. For everyone who's been listening all this time, thank you for sticking with us. We have a couple announcements before we end this webinar. Um, for those of you who enjoyed tonight's program and would like to see it again, we do plan to make the recording available very soon on our AHS YouTube page. Our next session in this year's Great American Gardeners webinar series will be on August 23rd, when Holly will be in conversation with Dr. Lucinda McDade, who is the Executive Director of the California Botanic Garden. And if you have not already registered for that session, you can do so on the American Horticultural Society website. We also very much value your feedback and ideas as we plan for future AHS programs. So immediately after this webinar, all the registrants will receive a survey. And this will give you an opportunity to offer feedback on tonight's program and also to share about your interests and preferences for the future of AHS programming. So please take a couple of minutes to complete the survey. Thank you for spending the past hour with us, and we look forward to seeing you again soon at another American Horticultural Society program. Good night, everyone. <laughs>